Big story tonight, remembering a Kenosha teen after tragedy. 15-year-old Kaylee Juga was shot and killed inside her Kenosha home this week. Hey guys, my name's Brooke and I enjoy researching strange occurrences, true crime, conspiracy theories, and whatever else you guys want to recommend to me down below in the comments. Let's keep the intros brief and jump right into the real reason you clicked on this video. Young love is often characterized by its intensity and passion. It's pretty much a whole new world for young people to explore. It's the beginning of discovering what you like and what you dislike and learning the intricacies of human interaction in a way that you've never experienced before. I'm sure you can remember the feelings that your first love evoked whether you're still with that person or if that person became a very important lesson to you. If you're in the latter category then you probably also remember the negatives of accessing this new level of maturity that you didn't have before. While I wish I could say that abuse is rare and doesn't exist in relationships, statistics plainly state otherwise. According to the National Domestic Violence Hotline, nearly 1.5 million high school students experience physical abuse from a romantic partner each year and 67% of those victims never report it or even tell any of their friends or family. 80% of parents deny that abuse in teenage relationships is an issue or aren't at all educated about the topic. So if you're a parent or a teacher or really anybody, I hope that at the very least today's case illuminates the very real and scary reality that abusive relationships are something to be wary of even earlier in life than you may think. Kaylee Juke was born on August 28, 2003 in Kenosha, Wisconsin to her mother Stephanie and her father Nick. In 2018, 15-year-old Kaylee was a student at Bradford High School where she was a cheerleader, a softball player, and a member of the National Honor Society. She was a very involved student. In her free time, she liked to spend time with her mom since they had a very close relationship and would go shopping, watch TV, go to the gym, basically everything. They just really enjoyed each other's company. Her parents Stephanie and Nick describe her as a very happy person whose positivity spread to those around her. Her mother described described Kaylee not only as a high school cheerleader, but sort of a personal cheerleader since she was always there for her mom, rooting her on in whatever endeavors she was finding herself in. Since Kaylee was pretty well known at school thanks to her many extracurriculars, it was no surprise when 15-year-old Martise Fuller saw her in the hallways of Bradford High School. Martise was a sophomore the year that Kaylee first caught his eye in the hallway. Although a majority of people who interacted with him would define him as what appeared to be a a pretty good kid, he wasn't the most dedicated student. More than anything, he was focused on playing football as the quarterback for the school's team. Both Kaylee and Martise were popular, and when they got together, it seemed to so many that they were just meant to be. That stereotypical couple of the cheerleader and the football player falling madly in love in high school and staying together forever. But underneath his stellar performance on the football field and his numerous friendships, Martise was dealing with an extremely unstable home life. Martise and his parents did not get along whatsoever. Martise was never in any sort of trouble at school, but at this point, he and his parents were constantly arguing. Although he'd never been involved in any legal trouble either, his parents eventually reached the extreme and perhaps irresponsible decision as parents to kick Martise out of their house. And just like that, the 15-year-old was out on the streets with nobody to depend on, especially not those who brought him into this world. Martise was grateful to have such a supportive group of friends at school though and he really appreciated them and their families allowing him to surf on their couches and join in on family meals here and there. But when Martise had seen Kaylee Juga in the hallways and struck up a friendship, the hardships that he was experiencing at the time didn't seem to be so hard with her by his side. They started off as friends to begin with, but as they began getting to know each other better, they realized that they actually had a lot in common and feelings began to develop. The two were even planning on attending the same college after their high school graduation, and it seemed as if the two were each other's missing piece of the puzzle. Being that Kaylee had such a close relationship with her mom, she was very excited to let her mom in on these growing feelings that she had for this friend that she'd met at school. Being a supportive mother, Stephanie was really happy to hear that her daughter had found a boy that made her smile even bigger than she did usually. Kaylee's family suggested inviting Martise to dinner one evening in order to to get to 
know this fella with whom their daughter was falling. This introductory dinner went extremely well, and that was the beginning of Martise and Kaylee's romantic relationship. And as the cherry on top of the Sunday, Kaylee's family and Martise quickly melded together as one. Kaylee's mom would pick him up from school along with Kaylee as if he was just another member of the family. His presence started to be expected on outings, special occasions, and holidays. At one point, he was even eating dinner with the Jugas two to three nights per week. It's pretty safe to say that things were going really great, and the young couple really complemented each other's lives well. The two really leaned on each other and found a lot of joy in their time spent together, and Martise finally had a place where he felt like he belonged after the rejection of his parents and hopping from couch to couch. At first, things appeared to be going swimmingly until they weren't. The first sign that things in their relationship were going south was when Kaylee's family noticed that she started spending hours upon hours on FaceTime with Martise just constantly and the two wouldn't even necessarily be talking to each other. They'd be doing two completely different things but no matter what it was they were always on FaceTime together. I can see this being more of a quote unquote normal albeit probably temporary behavior by two people who are like in a long distance relationship but keep in mind that Kaylee and Martise go to the same school and they even have classes together regularly. He's also coming to our house several times per week for dinner, so his insistence to be on FaceTime 24-7 is alarming and her family definitely took notice of this. Another telling symptom of something being very wrong in this relationship was the fact that when Kaylee would spend time with her family, which were already coming fewer and farther between under Martise's watchful eye, he would call over and over and over again, blowing up her phone when she was just trying to spend some valuable time with her loved ones. Kaylee wasn't completely blind to these red flags. She may have been young and this may have been her first relationship, but something here was clearly not right. The more she attempted to distance herself from this guy who had become so tightly intertwined in her life, the more he clung on. During the awkward occasions where they would have to pass each other in the hallway or be in the same class, Martise was known to steal Kaylee's phone out of her hand, ripping and twisting it from her grip in order to read through her text messages and social media, violating both her physical well-being and her privacy. Speaking of social media, Martise would go on his own pages and make posts about how much he was in love with Kaylee and how great of a person she was, followed by posts of the complete opposite statements. He called her a horrible person and accused her of cheating on him, and people even began to notice bruises of varying stages of healing on different parts of Kaylee's body. If you've never had the misfortune of encountering an abusive relationship, you may be thinking, why didn't she just leave? Abusive relationships are more often than not incredibly difficult situations for anyone to leave, whether you're a man or a woman of any age. There can be a lot of shame in admitting to others or even yourself that you're in a toxic situation. You may have ties to this person financially or with children, and not to mention the manipulation that commonly goes hand in hand with these types of abusive relationships. The victim can be made to feel very alone by their abuser isolating them from friends and family, causing them a sort of Stockholm Syndrome. The victim's safety can definitely be put in danger and maybe they just don't have or know about the resources that can provide support. Eventually, Kaylee did become extremely fed up with Martise's insecurities and abusive behavior and she just couldn't take it anymore. She broke up with him. But as I just mentioned, manipulation is common in these occurrences. It wasn't long before Martise managed to smooth talk his way back into Kaylee's life and even less time before he was acting horribly towards her yet again. Kaylee would get messages on social media from other girls hitting her with the, hey, I'm coming to you as a woman to let you know that your man is cheating on you with me. Which is extremely ironic considering that Martise is the one always out here accusing Kaylee of cheating, but I mean, that's usually how it goes, isn't it? Thankfully, Kaylee came back to reality pretty quickly after agreeing to rekindle this 
relationship with Martise and realized that things weren't any different than they had been before. But even though Kaylee officially called it quits on her relationship with Martise once and for all, he continued acting possessive towards her at school. He would still rip her phone from her hands and refuse to leave her alone, all while trying to plant seeds in her head that he was acting this way out of love. In January of 2019, these unwanted interactions on Martise's part set in motion what would be the start of a very tragic end. Kaylee and Martise had a class together at Bradford High, and understandably, Kaylee wanted to sit as far away from Martise as possible. It was bad enough that he sought her out in passing, but being stuck in a room with him for an entire class period was sure to cause unnecessary stress, which she wanted to steer completely clear of. But instead of Kaylee's subtle action of moving to the other side of the classroom as a temporary fix, this made Martise even more angry with her than he'd ever been. He grabbed her phone from her and a struggle ensued right in the middle of this science classroom with the teacher present and everything. Kaylee desperately wanted to be far, far away from this person that she once thought of as her first love, but he was making it impossible. The teacher did try to intervene, but ultimately made the decision to call campus security and the administration. The school staff actually gave Martise yet another chance just to give the phone back and be done with it, reminding him that this could not only affect his behavioral standing at school, but what he was doing was technically illegal and considered theft. Still, Martise's intense feelings of both possession and betrayal towards Kaylee led to him smashing the phone on the floor before agreeing to go to the office with the administrators. On the way out of the classroom, Martise grabbed Kaylee by her backpack and said, you really gonna do me like this? Sir, you absolutely did this to yourself, so like, like, what? Both Kaylee and Martise were taken to the front office. Martise for disciplinary action and Kaylee to explain what was going on between the two. After the vice principal listened to Kaylee explain the complicated and exhausting dynamic between her and her ex-boyfriend, they came to the conclusion that it would be best for both of the students to be separated into different classes and avoid any contact in passing. The school administration decided to contact Martise's mother and have her come to the campus in order to sit down for a meeting discussing the path moving forward with her son. The vice principal explained that Martise and Kaylee were to have no contact on school grounds, and if Martise didn't comply, he would be enrolled into a strictly online program for public school students in the county. This would not only mean that Martise would be unable to physically come to school, but he would also be unable to continue playing football. Unsurprisingly, Martise did not agree with this at all. I didn't see this mentioned anywhere during my research, but I can only speculate that this really upset him more than your average kid. From a young age, Martise's parents did not provide him with a stable or loving environment where he felt like he could depend on them. He found himself relying heavily on his friends just to get through the day. At some point, school probably became a safe haven for him where he didn't have to think about where he was going to lay his head to sleep at night or how he was going to get food in his stomach. It was also where he was able to appreciate his love of playing football. Then he met Kaylee and her family became like his. It seemed like everything was falling right into place, but Martise just couldn't let a good thing be. I'm not at all trying to excuse Martise's actions and I think it's pretty deplorable that he's subjected this kind and sweet young girl to the things that he did, but I'm just trying to paint a picture for what could have been going through his head at the time. He might have been in a difficult situation with his family, but there was no reason for him to take out these issues on somebody who did nothing but act as a safe space for him. He had dedicated so much of his time to keeping Kaylee under his thumb that this decision to keep them separated seemed unthinkable. So much so, in fact, that when the plan was explained to Martise, he stood up from his chair, got in the assistant principal's face, and called her a liar. The assistant principal described this event as the first time she actually felt afraid of a student during a disciplinary meeting. And that was just a fraction of what Kaylee had been subject to behind closed doors all of this time. As these type of situations often do, things did not improve between the two teens and in fact actually got a whole lot worse. In his vengeful rage, Marty started stalking 15-year-old Kaylee. He would circle around the Juga house all hours of the day and night, not attempting to hide it 
at all. He wanted Kaylee to feel the discomfort that he did, and he struck a lot of fear into her and her family. His behavior was no secret either. Even though Martise and his family weren't getting along and he was back to couch surfing with friends, they caught word of their son relentlessly following Kaylee around and even called her parents to make sure that they were aware of this. Whenever Kaylee hung out with friends, it became a habit that the entire group of friends would turn off their Snapchat locations just to make sure that Martise couldn't see where they were and show up. By the way, I recommend that you don't have your Snapchat location on anyways, you know, maybe just use Find My Phone or something similar with a few close people, but that is neither here nor there. When she wasn't busy with school or extracurriculars, Kaylee worked at a local dry cleaner where she was a very valued employee. As Martise's unwanted presence continued to plague Kaylee's existence, her boss at the dry cleaner allowed her to lock the doors of the business whenever she worked alone so that she was able to have complete control over who could come in and out of the business. I can only imagine how exhausted and helpless Kaylee must have felt at this time. Whether it be at school, home, or work, she hadn't been able to relax without looking over her shoulder for a very long time. If she had known this would be the outcome to her once happy relationship, she probably never would have involved herself with Martise to begin with. But of course, she couldn't go back and change the past, so she tried her best to remain hopeful that Martise would grow tired of keeping her under his watchful eye. Martise was not letting up though. In April of 2019, Kaylee actually begrudgingly put in her two weeks notice at the dry cleaners even though she really enjoyed her co-workers and her job there because the bottom line was that she didn't want Martise knowing where she worked. She was able to lock the doors when she was there by herself, but that didn't stop the fact that when she was opening or closing for the night, she never knew where Martise could be lurking. Not only was Martise a dark cloud continuing to hover over Kaylee's life, but he had dark plans brewing in the back of his obsessive mind. After unrelentlessly stalking her for months and months, Martise decided that if he couldn't have Kaylee, nobody could. The month after she quit her job in order to distance herself from her ex's unrelenting pursuit, Martise would carry out the plan that he'd been plotting for a while. On May 9th, 2019, the Juga household was preparing to go on a family camping trip the following morning. They were crossing off their checklists, packing up their things, and overall excited just to get off the grid for a little bit and step away from this hostile situation that was always lingering right around the corner. That very same same day, Martise had asked one of his friends to drop him off at a specific location at 1 p.m., which was uncoincidentally only 10 blocks from Kaylee's house. He told this same friend to pick him up at the same place in two and a half hours. But little did this friend know that Martise was doing a whole lot more than just hanging out at this seemingly random location. The reality of the situation was that Martise had acquired both a gun and ammunition from one of his friends after claiming that he needed it as protection against Kaylee's father and brother. Martise also had a bicycle and a change of clothing stashed at this location in preparation for what he had planned next. It was eventually discovered that not much later, a neighbor of the Juga family had a security camera which captured 16-year-old Martise jumping a nearby fence before sneaking into the family's garage wearing black clothing and white shoes. While Kaylee was upstairs in her bedroom just listening to music, packing for the camping trip the next day, and getting ready to head off to work that evening, Martise crept up the stairs with his presence undetected by any members of the household. Only moments later, Kaylee's mother Stephanie, who was downstairs, heard a blood-curdling scream coming from the second story of her house, followed by the sound of a gun firing several times and another scream. Martise had shot Kaylee four times in the chest and once in the head without a single warning or even a second thought. Stephanie ran upstairs as soon as she heard the chaos in her daughter's room and it was immediately met with the sight of Martise standing in the doorway of her daughter's bedroom. Martise then turned around and pointed the gun at Kaylee's mom. Stephanie begged and pleaded with the 16 year old telling him that he didn't have to do this. He had already done more than enough damage and hurting another person wasn't going to make the situation any better. To this Martise responded, yes I do, before shooting her as well. Suffering this gunshot wound, Stephanie 
managed to get to the nearest bathroom in the home and try to call 911. But when she attempted to close and lock the door, Marty shot her once again in the arm. Luckily, she was able to call 911 and have authorities dispatched immediately, but she was still in shock about this nightmare situation unfolding right in her own home. Martise was quick to flee the scene, especially since he had already set up his getaway plan. The same neighbor's security camera footage caught him exiting the Juga household only three minutes after he had entered, and another security camera down the street captured Martise riding a bike in the opposite direction of the crime scene, wearing different clothing than his original black outfit. Once the paramedics arrived to the scene, they were able to get Stephanie to stable condition, but unfortunately, Kaylee succumbed to her injuries at the scene. Once Stephanie was taken to the hospital, the shock of everything slowly wore off and she realized the gravity of what had just happened. Not only did she lose one of her most beloved people on this entire earth, but she was stuck with $15,000 worth of medical debt that was no fault of her own. Immediately once authorities were made aware of this nightmare situation, there was an overnight manhunt to find Martise Fuller. Meanwhile, he was frantically trying to get to his aunt's house who lived in town. When his friend picked him back up at the drop-off point, they noticed that Martise's once clean white shoes were covered in mud and that he had seemed extremely worked up. He supposedly told this friend that a group of girls had shot Kaylee and that she was dead. And then I guess the friend just did nothing with this information, you know, just dropped Martise off at his cousin's house and was like, peace out, dude. Everything's fine. Much like a movie, tensions in the house grew quickly when his aunt recognized Martise's face plastered all over the TV screen in the news, along with the public warning to stay away from this young man since he was believed to have just shot and killed his ex-girlfriend, hours ago. Martise's aunt made the decision not to call the police on him, but she did make him get out of her house. She did not want to be harboring a fugitive. One of Martise's cousins who was living at the house actually went with him to dispose of the murder weapon in a nearby sewer. Luckily, it didn't require too much effort for authorities to locate Martise, and less than 15 hours later on May 10th, police found him hiding out at another cousin's house around 6.30 a.m. where he finally surrendered. Martise's cousin would soon tell police that Martise had come to her home that morning acting very strange and panicked. When she asked him what was wrong, he finally admitted for the first time that he had killed Kaylee. He tried to lessen the blow of this news by claiming that he only meant to shoot her twice as if that makes the situation any better. As the police continued questioning Martise and his loved ones, Martise's mother actually falsely claimed that Martise was home at the time of Kaylee's death. For somebody who dislikes her own son enough to ban him from her home and not take care of him, I guess she felt the need to protect him still. Eventually, though, his mother would confess to her lies and say that Martise admitted to her that he did kill Kaylee as well. The cousin that went with Martise to dispose of the murder weapon in a sewer agreed to lead police to the gun, which gave them very valuable evidence against this dangerous kid. However, the black outfit and the white shoes that Martise was seen leaving the Juga household in were never recovered. Martise was promptly arrested on murder charges as an adult, with his bail set to $1 million. His trial would take place later that year, where his defense tried to argue that Martise had a clean criminal record and wasn't anywhere near Kaylee's house the day of May 9th. They tried to argue that there was no physical evidence of Martise being at the scene of the crime, and that his cousins and mother had completely lied about Martise confessing the murder to them. On the stand, one of Kaylee's close friends testified that she bore witness to several incidents in which Martise would intimidate Kaylee by showing up to whatever location she was at, whether it be work, home, school, anywhere, as long as he could harass her regularly. Her ex-boss at the dry cleaners testified that when Kaylee had put in her two weeks notice, citing the fear of Martise harming her while she was alone at the store, her boss was really sad to lose her as an employee since she was a really hard worker and genuinely enjoyed being a part of the team. But he also said that he wasn't surprised when it came to her quitting because Martise was known to call and harass her constantly during her shift. An administrator at the school also went on to state that this was an extreme case of 
domestic abuse and that she actually feared this exact outcome. I always say that hindsight is 2020, and I don't know exactly what the school faculty could do beyond removing Martise from the campus, which they did do, but I just feel like somewhere along the way, a restraining order or something more should have been done in the protection of this young girl who was doing nothing wrong but trying to be happy after heartbreak and abuse. After three and a half hours of deliberation and the attempt to have him tried as a juvenile, the now 18-year-old Martise was convicted as an adult of first-degree intentional homicide against Kaylee, attempted first-degree murder against Stephanie, and armed burglary of the Juga home. When the verdict was announced, Martise broke down into tears after days of appearing emotionless and unaffected. Both the perpetrator's family and the victim's families were left completely speechless. Commissioner Lauren Keating went on to state that Martise's behavior throughout the crime and legal proceedings was senseless and chilling, adding that it was premeditated and cowardly. After his conviction while awaiting sentencing in Kenosha County Prison, Martise participated in a gang-style beatdown of another teen who was only 17 years old and in for car theft. It was also discovered that during his recorded calls on the prison phone, Martise had asked some of his friends to contact the jurors on his case and speak favorably about his character, which is just so incredibly wrong morally and probably illegal. Like, please just take your consequences and stop trying to worm your way out of it. Finally, on May 21st at the sentencing, Kaylee's mother Stephanie read her victim impact statement to the judge, which I can only imagine was extremely difficult to get through. Not only did she have to talk about getting shot by this young man she'd allowed into her home, but she had to explain to the judge who her daughter was and how special she was to the family knowing that she was gone forever. Martise's attorney also read a letter that Martise had written stating that he felt sorry about what happened, but that he didn't do it. Why are you apologizing if you didn't do anything wrong? Like, wow, I'm sorry that happened to you, but was it me? The letter also stated, quote, it's hard to have tears left to cry knowing that my mom lost a son, one of her children too. Yeah, which was also your fault, but don't worry, you'll have plenty of time to reflect on that within your new lifelong home. After hearing these letters, some more valid than others, the judge called Martise a damaged and dangerous human being, stating that she didn't believe Martise would ever learn his lesson and stop blaming his actions on other people. In the end, he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. When the verdict was read this time, true to his letter, Martise didn't shed a single tear for himself and especially not for his victims. After the court proceedings came to a close, the entire community in Kenosha was very supportive of the Juga family. Their neighbors often left flowers on the front lawn in solidarity, not wanting to overstep into an already difficult situation, but wanting to display their support in case the family needed anything. Many of the townspeople had even collectively written to the judge prior to the sentencing, explaining how much of a loss Kaylee's death was to the community and how much pain it caused all of them. Abusive relationships can and do happen to people regardless of their age, location, gender, level of success, education, and it's a serious problem, especially for younger people who maybe don't have the experience to recognize that something is wrong until it's too late. It's like that metaphor about a frog in a pot. If you throw a frog into boiling water, it's going to jump out because it's burning. But if you were to put that frog into tepid water and slowly heat it up, it won't be able to recognize the growing danger until it's already reached the point of no return. Turns out that this actually isn't true and frogs are pretty capable of monitoring their own body temperatures, but you get the picture. Unfortunately, while Kaylee did try to make adjustments in her life in order to avoid Martise's increasingly worrying behavior, it wasn't enough. And it shouldn't have had to be enough. She was a 15 year old dealing with the struggles that are pretty much a package deal that come with being a teenage girl. And she shouldn't have had to live in fear of this kid who she once thought of as her first love, terrorizing her almost daily. Could a restraining order have been sought? 
Yeah. But Martise demonstrated that he felt above the rules like they didn't apply to him. He continued his unacceptable behavior inside the prison walls while he awaited sentencing and didn't take a moment to stop and think, maybe this is the type of thing that got me into this situation to begin with. Clearly a teen boy does not have a fully developed brain, yet so many manage to make it through their lives without committing the atrocities that Martise did. In the end, Kaylee's family will forever remember her as their own personal cheerleader and Martise won't find his way off the bench. With that, we've just about reached the end of today's video and I really hope you learned a thing or two or at least became aware of Kaylee's tragic case. Once again, I'm always taking suggestions for topics that you'd like me to cover in future videos. Otherwise, I'm just rolling with the punches. Either way, if you enjoy, don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you can see me here every single Monday. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.